All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'd like to be able to share with you uh, a story about quantum simulation using quantum signal processing. And I hope you don't mind that I'm taking the liberty of giving this lecture as I would in class. Uh, namely, I'll be writing it as if I have a blackboard up here. Please, therefore, please feel free to interrupt me, ask questions as I go along, and you'll have to wave your hands very uh, wildly because it may be hard for me to see you. Um, but I'd like to begin with uh, a foundation you know, of a technique called quantum signal processing. I'll tell you a little more about the history of this and the math as I go along. But suffice to say that it is a rather uh, uh, succinct mathematical framework from which I will show you can get amplitude amplification and Grover's quantum search algorithm. We then uh, will go into a technique called commutization, which is very simple and straightforward, that allows a Hamiltonian to be used in this signal processing framework in such a way that we can transform its eigenvalues almost arbitrarily by a desired polynomial. And I'll give you restrictions on this in a moment. By dint of this ability to transform the eigenvalues, we will be able to perform quantum simulation efficiently. And then after that, if we have time, uh, I'll show you how this generalizes to a framework called quantum singular value transformation. And because of this generalization, this technique actually captures almost all of what we know about quantum algorithms. It not just captures Grover's algorithm and uh, quantum simulation, but also Peter Shor's factoring algorithm and quantum phase estimation and all the quantum walk algorithms that we know about. And uh, there are very few I don't know which fit into this framework. So it's quite interesting and exciting and depressing at the same time. Okay, so let me begin. And I'd like to try to begin from a, a starting point which uh, we all have in common. So although I'll be telling you first about quantum signal processing, Let's start with asking and answering a, a very simple question. By the way, is there a small echo? Working on it. Yeah. Working on it, okay. Um, all right, so consider the following question. Given a unitary, uh, u being e to the i theta x, and this x is a Pauli operator, as is usual, where the angle of theta is unknown. What is this matrix element, P being zero, U sub theta, zero? And I'm asking you this simple starting question because I expect you all know the answer right away. And so let's write that out and I'd like you to help me a little bit. How might I write u sub theta as a two by two matrix? Can somebody please shout it out? I will just sit here and wait for you. Cosine theta. Thank you. Cosine theta. I sine theta. I sine theta. And cosine theta. Thank you. And the columns are the basis vector zero, one, the rows are zero and one, like so. And because of that, we should be able to identify the matrix element which corresponds to P. So what is P? Cosine theta. Cosine theta. It's the top left matrix element over here. So P is equal to cosine theta. And if I were to plot P squared as a function of theta in units of pi, the answer should not surprise you at all. Let's go uh, uh, like this. And it is a cosine squared. So it goes kind of down like this smoothly. Forgive me for my drawing on this pad. And this is cosine squared theta. And this point that we have down here is where we would have a pi pulse. Okay, so that should be fairly straightforward. Um, and I'm going to go fairly fast from here. 
Um, but let's let's not go too far from this starting point and try a question that's based on this. Suppose I give you this box use of data. And again, you don't know what data is. And I would like you to construct a quantum circuit. And you're allowed to use any operators you want, single qubit, two qubit, whatever you like. What I'd like your quantum circuit to do is to flip the qubit from zero to one uh, if and only if theta is approximately equal to pi over two. In other words, I want a pi pulse to do what a pi pulse normally does, but if theta is slightly away from pi, pi is away, then I don't want it to do uh, the flip. In other words, I maybe I can draw it on this diagram up here. I'd like it to do something not like is shown in this normal Rabi oscillation, but instead something sharp, like this. In fact, ideally, I'd like it to be really, really sharp. Is that possible? It looks like this is a very nonlinear transformation. And so what I've got dashed here in blue is the desired The remarkable thing is that, that this is possible and the construction for it is well known in the art of nuclear magnetic resonance. And the reason that it's well known is because experimentalists are cheap. Experimentalists like buying amplifiers, which have some uh, amount of amplification which is kind of variable, like as it gets hotter, it might amplify less, uh, or vice versa when it cools down. And despite the fluctuations of the amount of amplitude that you get out, you like the, 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 the system to apply a pi pulse when you want a pi pulse. So the way you do this is by making a construction which has this very common pattern so let's imagine our qubit initially starts out in state psi, and then we'll perform the use of theta operation and follow that with a rotation around the z-axis, which I'll write as z sub p1. And then we repeat our, un our rotation by an unknown angle. You know, we're, we're going to keep on doing this sandwich this pattern this pattern of unknown followed by known followed by unknown and known and so forth and by doing this with a sequence of, of known angles b about, about, uh, which describe a rotation around the z-axis of the box here, we're going to accomplish this desired transformation. And in particular, I'm going to give you a, a specific, well-known example of this called BB1. So this is a really beautiful pulse sequence. BB stands for broadband, and it's number one in a sequence of a whole bunch of these kinds of constructions. Um, and in this construction, there's one parameter, which is called, which I'll call here phi, and it has the value of one half inverse cosine of minus pi over, sorry, one over four. And this is an, an axis in the block sphere. And the construction is just like I showed in above with an unknown known sequence. We'll start out with a u sub b, so u sub theta. Then we perform z sub b 
key with this special angle. Again, the use of theta. Then I do something slightly different from before, uh, in that uh, not z p, but rather z minus two p. And then a use of theta. And then I have a z zero. Remember this this uh, p is the amount of rotation angle in, in here. So what is z zero? Come on, be proud, be clearly identity. Yes, it, I'm putting in here because I want to uh, fit the pattern. So u theta, and then I'm just going to reverse the sequence that I had before, z of 2p, u sub theta, and a z sub p. And I will end there. So there's no final u sub theta. Okay, and the upshot of this, this sequence is if we call this sequence, let's name this something. We'll call this uh, u, u sub p vec, meaning that there is a vector of, ang of angles, phases, p minus 2p, 0, 2p, and p. And this is a vector of real numbers, and that vector of real numbers determines this entire sequence u theta is given to you and that's already fixed. And the, this matrix element, P, if I plot this and uh, call this the response function in the future, again, as a function of theta in units of pi, now looks like this. Minus one half to one. Uh, it starts out here at one, uh, and it's very, very flat here. And then it comes down sharply here and comes back up, just like I asked for. Okay. And the neat thing about this this kind of construction is that essentially what I've done is to realize something which has this kind of an instruction. If theta is approximately equal to pi over two, then flip the qubit. And this is like a computation. where the input is not the state psi of the qubit, the input is the, the angle theta of the rotation. And it's kind of mind-blowing to think of that. that. That's the input is a classical real number. And I'm transforming it by a function here. So in this sense, theta is an input. And your first homework problem, is to work this matrix out. I think I've given you everything you need to get the two by two matrix U sub P vec. All right, and uh, some hints. Uh, what is U sub P vec when theta is equal to zero? Well, when theta is equal to zero, what is u sub theta? Identity. So we can uh, think this goes away, this goes away, and you can see that the z zero is an identity. This minus two p cancels this plus two p. This p cancels this minus p, except that I forgot the minus sign. The right way to check things. Okay, and thus, the 
uh, this sequence becomes identity. The same thing happens when it's up to overall factors, uh, 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 complex angles for uh, u being uh, theta being equal to pi. And then you can also check the case when theta equals pi over two and, and show directly that you get this uh, point at zero over here. Okay. And this is a, a technique that was used in nuclear magnetic resonance uh, and still is. The reason is because, for example, um, this point here might correspond to uh, a place where your blood is flowing. What you like to do in the magnetic resonance image is to have an extremely sharp line that shows where your blood exists. That's where the hemoglobin is lowering the T2 of the protons in the water in your body. And, and you want to see exactly those points. So they use these kinds of pulse sequences. And there are pulse sequences that can make this, this uh, uh, dip here as sharp as you want. So instead of being this width, which you'll get from 3D1, by running a, sh a longer sequence, you can make that increasingly sharp. And it's a good question to ask how sharp given a number of pulses. And so let me answer those kinds of questions by giving you a theorem. So uh, first, let me set up the theorem with the definition. Let u sub p vector be equal to e to the i p naught z. This is that z rotation. A, a rotation which I'll call r sub a. I'm going to use a specific form of rotation because it will be convenient to our algorithms in just a moment e to the i e1 z r of a i and so forth ending with e to the i p sub d z i'm going to start my p's from zero and go to d uh, where This rotation R sub R of A will be of this form. Right? A square root of one minus A squared, square root of one minus A squared minus A. Right. Anyone know what uh, kind of operation this is on a cubic? If I were to write it uh, in exponential form. It's a y rotation, thank you, uh, by angle of cosine minus one of a uh, up to factors of two. So specifically, it's r sub y of minus two inverse cosine of a. Okay. But I'm going to use this form of, of the definition uh, because it's convenient for um, uh, making a lot of notation simpler. Um, and if you multiply z rotations like this with y rotations, a z and a y, then you might note that this sequence is got to be a polynomial in A and some other terms like this. Okay, because that's just what happens when you multiply these uh, phases. This is a diagonal matrix. It looks like uh, e to the i p naught 0, 0, e to the minus i p naught. That's this operator here. And so multiplying these phases with this matrix over and over can only give you a polynomial like so. So I hope the following theorem is not too surprising to you. Yes, please. So why is this minus here? Why? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're asking about why this minus is here. Yeah. Isn't it cosine It has to be unitary. So I was actually pulling a, a, a trick on you. This has a, um, and uh, it is not actually a rotation, it's a reflection operator. It's not actually R Y, and in fact, if I will be more precise, I'll do this, and that fixes everything. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Other questions? Uh, I will fix the rotation issue in just a moment. It turns out that um, it's great that it's a reflection, and it will technically not matter very much. Other questions? Yes, please. Yes, it does. Uh, but that robustness in rotation is nothing more than uh, exactly this uh, response function here. Okay. Well, okay, I can't quite show it anymore, but it's this narrowness over here. And, and by the way, uh, this sequence is called BB1, but there's also MB1, which broadens it out in the opposite way. And there are lots of You'll see in just a moment. I, let me give you the theorem, and then you'll see why it's actually useful for uh, robustness. The theorem is the following. And this theorem is called quantum signal processing with reflections. And uh, in this lecture, I'm going to use this theorem some 10 times or so. So if there's nothing else you take away from uh, today's uh, uh, class session, let it be just this one theorem. And the theorem is the following. If I do this sequence for use of P back, so that is I have an E to the I, P naught Z, and then a product. So I'm going to write it in a product form so that we're going to see this structure of expression over and over again. There are D queries to this operator R sub A. A is usually an unknown angle. E to the I, P sub J, Z. Um, and this expression here is nothing more than the U sub D back. The meat of the theorem says that this is equal to a polynomial P, another polynomial Q times square root of 1 minus A squared, a Q star, because this must be unitary, square root of 1 minus A squared, and a Q star, because this must be a minus P star. Okay. But the, the point of the theorem is not just that it's equal to that. So the theorem holds in this forward direction. But also, and this is the most important part of the theorem, it holds in the reverse direction. As long as the polynomials uh, satisfy certain uh, constraints. And these are very reasonable constraints. I'll actually write them out for you here for completeness. So this is Q or A being in the range of minus one to one. And polynomials, P and Q, if and only if, first, uh, P, here, let me write these on the side. V of P is going to be D. And the degree of Q will be less than or equal to D minus 1. P will have definite parity. D mod Q will also have parity that's definite. D minus 1 mod 2. And then we need U to be unitary. So that is P squared plus 1 minus A squared. Q squared must equal to 1. These are reasonable constraints. They will cause P and Q to be pinned at different points. But look, you get to choose 
uh, a nearly arbitrary degree d polynomial. And this theorem tells you that you can get a realization of that polynomial as a transformation by specifying d plus one coefficients here. And this overall uh, first one isn't that relevant, so it's essentially d coefficients. d real numbers gives you a polynomial transformation. And uh, let me sketch the proof argument for you here. Uh, first, in the forward direction, it's very easy. This is by induction. So we have uh, for b equal to 0 that uh, p is equal to d to the i d naught, and q is equal to 0 if we do that. When d is uh, greater than or equal to 1, then we have a recursive equation. p will be, uh, well, go to uh, d to the i d sub d times a p plus 1 minus a squared times q. And q will go to e to the minus i d sub d uh, times p minus a q. So there's a recursive equation for that. The, the hard part is actually the reverse of this. So in this direction, I'm not going to give you the proof, but the proof is actually given by a well-known algorithm called the Remez exchange algorithm. from classical signal processing. From filter design. And that's why this is called quantum signal processing. Okay, I'll pause here for a second. Questions? If not, I'll give an example. Question, yes, please. What are the polynomials P and Q? For example, they can be constant. Uh, but I'll give you an example in just a moment. Why don't I give you the example and then uh, we'll have a moment again for questions. Okay. So let's do a very simple example. Suppose that uh, E is a vector D naught, D1, D2, and so forth. This. And uh, let's start out with p being equal to 0, comma, 0. Then p will equal what? Anyone? Just yell it out. Um, let's see here. I'd like to scroll up so you can see the formula I can. How's that? So we have 0, 0. That means this is identity, and this is identity. And we're going to have one r sub a, r of a. So where is p in this expression? It's just a. It's just a. Very good. So we can write down here p is equal to a. And what is Q? One. One. Because I factored out the uh, square root of uh, 1 minus a square root of the definition over here. Okay. So now let's try 0, comma, 0, comma, 0. And now you can use these recursive relationships that are right above here and tell me what uh, P is. Conviction. Say it with conviction. Show me. One. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. What is D? I heard it. Two. Yeah. 
Yes, okay. So now P is going to be of a higher order. It's going to be order A squared. Uh, and you can use this recursion re relation right here. Use the recursion relation. Okay, so what's P in this case? I have a typo? Okay, where? Oh, yes, yes, you're absolutely right. I have a typo. This is not 1 minus a squared. This is a squared minus 1. It must be a squared minus 1. See, is that right? Yeah, so suppose I need that minus sign. Okay, great. I know what I want the answers to be, so <laughs> I, it's totally independent of what I write down on here. What is the answer that I want it to be? Or what do you now get? Again? 2a squared minus 1. 2a squared minus 1. Yeah, great. Thank you for catching the error. 2a squared minus 1. And uh, q is going to be equal to 2a if I got everything right. So we can keep on going. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And uh, I'll just give you the polynomial in case I made a mistake somewhere else. So it should be a times minus 3 plus 4a squared. And um, those of you of mathematical inclination may recognize these polynomials, this sequence, as the Chebyshev polynomials. Of the first kind. T sub L minus 1. I might want to substitute D in there. Um, and so let's try a homework problem here. A quick question. Yes. Go ahead. Can I confirm the 0, 0, 0 big relation corresponds to R of A times R of A? Yeah, did I make a mistake? So, like, I think that the recursion formula that you have probably doesn't correspond to the R of A. Oh yes, because I have a reflection here. You're right. Um, okay, that's very good. So uh, let's see. Here, let's change the, the homework problem to uh, uh, fix the recursion relation. <laughs> for the case it, that replaces r of a with uh, w of a equal, uh, I, see, I want a i square root of 1 minus a squared, i square root of 1 minus a squared a. And I know this is a rotation about the x-axis. That's okay. There's no reflection, and then I know this case works out right. And exactly what you said was correct. We do need the rotations to add up. Uh, the reflections cause you some problems along the way. I apologize for that. I changed my mind and decided to give you a, a different version of the USB theorem uh, this morning. Okay, so I hope this gives you uh, a flavor of the kind of polynomials. Um, the old homework problem I had intended here was for you to plot the polynomials because then they it would give you uh, a good sense of um, what they look like. But like the number of wiggles corresponds to the degree of the polynomial. And these uh, polynomials, you'll see, actually turn out to be a definition of a quantum algorithm. And so with that in mind, um, I'll move on and next show you a quantum algorithm based on this. But I'll pause first and see if there are any questions. Or if I've made any other mistakes to test to see if you're paying attention. Yes, please. Does it seem to be a following your following of the, I don't know how to pronounce the last one. Chebyshev? Chebyshev. 
Yeah, the Qs will also be a kind of uh, standard polynomial. In this case, I don't actually remember what it is. So that's a great homework problem. Other questions? Yes, please. There exists an algorithm which will find for you the vector of phases P that will give you the P and the Q that you specify as long as they satisfy these constraints. And the algorithm doesn't take very long to run. So it, I'm not going to define its efficiency formally here um, because it, it's not um, a very robust algorithm even though it's fast. So if you want it to be robust, then uh, it can be a little fragile. Uh, it, it's not going to run as fast as you would like it to be, but you can make it run fast and fragile. Nevertheless, this is the algorithm that's used to design a lot of filter functions for the discrete signal processing, digital signal processor on your phones. So it's widely used. Other questions? OK, let's look at amplitude amplification. And I hope this will be fun. Amplitude amplification is a basic quantum algorithmic primitive that's widely used, in fact, even in quantum simulation, for example, uh, to fix up the pulse selection that's needed or linear combination of unitaries, as you saw in Nathan's beautiful lecture. So here's the problem that it solves, or the problem that you would like to solve. You were given a U which has, in one specific matrix location, so this is a many qubit large unitary matrix, that in some column labeled D0, and at some row position labeled A0, we have a matrix element, A, little a. And your goal, uh, you're also given A sub P, which is a rotation I, E to I, D, A0, A0 and you're given D sub P, D to the I, D, B0, B0. In other words, you're given a kind of oracle which allows you to rotate around the axes defined by the row and column of the location of a matrix element inside this many qubit operator. And the problem is that you would like to be able to amplify that um, matrix uh, element A to make it larger. And let me write that down as an explicit request. So you are told to construct a quantum circuit, chi, which can take in u, can use a sub p, and can use b sub p. And uh, you would like this to have, to satisfy this constraint that A naught chi D naught is as close to one as possible. So D naught is the starting state and A naught is the target state. Now, on the surface of it, it looks like this statement of problem is very different from what I just went through with quantum signal processing. But actually, it turns out to be exactly the same. In fact, completely mathematically the same, given the, the right constructions. And the way we're going to see that that's true is by recognizing that inside this problem, there are actually, so in quantum signal processing, everything was about a block sphere. We were only talking about SU2, nothing else. No multi-qubits, no entanglement, just rotating a single qubit. Here, this U is a many-qubit 
operator. And it seems very strange to think that we may be able to solve this problem by thinking of just the dynamics of SU2. But in fact, inside this problem, there are two concentric block spheres. And they are defined by a Hilbert space given by the axes uh, A, uh, A0, excuse me, and A perf, which I'll now define. So A perf, let us take as being uh, the thing that's left over from UB0. So that is mathematically uh, the projection I minus A naught A naught times U B zero normalized. Um, and I'll, I'll try to give you all the mathematical statements like this, but in just a moment I'll also draw it so that hopefully it'll be clearer. And the reason this is defined in such a way is in order for us to be able to uh, write out this initial state, u b0. Because we, we're going to guess that the first thing we're going to do is apply u to the start state. Remember, u is this big operator. And we would like to express u applied to this starting state as having a component that's a times u, uh, excuse me, a naught. So that is, there's a component along the original state plus a piece that's not along it. So that's 1 minus a squared times a perf. Notice that we're switching from the b space to the a space in this. And uh, that also this is this, this number A here is the matrix element that's in the middle that I drew up there. A naught, U, B naught, like that. And for sake of simplicity, I will assume A being real. But it will work out even if it's not. Let me make a second definition. which is just like here I defined a perf, I'm going to define b perf. And this will be defined such that in an uh, expression very similar to that one, but let me write it out and show you the intent of this, that u b perf uh, is equal to minus a times a perf plus square root of one minus a squared times a naught. Okay. Now, I realize that these definitions may look um, like googly gawk math um, just by staring at them. So instead, what I'd like to use to illustrate the meaning behind them is a depiction of a block sphere. So uh, let's see if I can draw a circle on this pad. Here we go. Um, suppose that's the origin, this is one of the axes, and this is supposed to be uh, round. Okay, and now lay, let me label the axes for you, and then I hope uh, the idea will come out. If this is A naught, then the orthogonal axis in the block sphere is the one that goes in the opposite direction. So this would be a perf. And in addition to that, 
we're going to have another axis for B. And this axis I'm not going to be able to draw very well. But hopefully you can uh, see approximately where it's going to be. B curve and B naught. And the idea is that the uh, initial state U applied to uh, B naught. So B naught is the start state. Uh, when we apply U to it, it will uh, rotate it to some other point over here that is not yet very close to A naught because it, it, the number A is kind of small. So this point is U and B naught. And it is close to something that's far away from the final state that we want to get to. And uh, um, we have this ability to rotate using U here by some angle uh, that we'll, we will see uh, will turn out to be theta. We also have the ability to rotate around the B axis, and we have the ability to rotate around the A axis, like so. And these are the three things we're allowed to do, and we have uh, constructions, mathematical ability gates to do. Um, and on this block sphere, in the space of this effective qubit, we have something beautiful. That is that on this manifold of uh, A naught, B naught, plus A curve and B curve, uh, the big multi-qubit operation U can be written as the following, just by using the algebra that I've given you so far. A naught, B naught, minus A curve, uh, B curve. Okay, that comes from a combination of this expression and uh, this expression here, this expression here, uh, plus A square root of one minus A squared times something which flips from B curve to A naught. and from B naught to A curve, like so. In other words, uh, this U can be written as a two by two matrix, an SU2 operation, which is A square root of one minus A squared, square root of one minus A squared minus A, but on a funny set of vectors. Uh, these are uh, B naught basis vectors, B curve, and A naught, and B curve, like so. Okay. So this large uh, operation that I've, I've been given actually flips between two different block spheres. Uh, it maps the B space to the A space each time it's used. And once you use it again, uh, if you use U dagger afterwards, it'll go from A back to B. But you're never going to want to do U, 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 U once you realize this, because you need to go in the same space each time in the appropriate space. And this matrix here is nothing more than the R of A that I gave you earlier. And now I'll, I'll write out how it's a reflection. It's an x times r sub y uh, by theta, where this angle theta is 2 arc sine of a. OK. Now at this point, you see that we have an, a, a block sphere operation. This uh, SU2 operation. Uh, right here is exactly what we had used earlier in our quantum signal processing theorem. And this means that I can now write down a theorem which looks just like the quantum signal processing theorem earlier, but has a slight difference. And let me give that expression to you. 
and then I'll pause and uh, see if you have questions. So we want to end up in the state A naught, and we're going to perform an A, B naught here, and a sequence of U's and U daggers. We'll do uh, U, B, B, 2K minus 1. The time order, of course, goes in reverse of this that I'm writing, but let me read it in this order. This is a 2P. of 2k and we start from the state u b0 and the theorem says that this is a polynomial in a so it, it looks just like the quantum signal processing theorem in that we're starting out in some state and we're going to end up in another state that's like that zero zero and in between we do a sequence which is known, excuse me, unknown, known, unknown, known, unknown, and we repeat this. And then we end with something which is a known rotation. The known rotations we had earlier were Z rotations. Here we have these funny A and B sub B rotations. But actually, this A rotation, if you look at the blocks here, excuse me, I'm sorry about that, if you look at this box here, this A rotation is on the z-axis of this block sphere. So in fact, this A phi sub 2k or whatever is a z rotation. And so is the rotation around the d-axis, this axis over here. This is just a different block sphere, and it has its own z-axis. So we're going to have a, a, a y-axis rotation, a z-axis rotation, a y-axis, a z-axis, and so forth, even though we're switching between two block spheres. And as long as you uh, allow yourself that degree of freedom of realizing that there are two block spheres here, then it looks just like quantum signal processing. Or I can just write out the map for this and not have to use the intuition by recognizing that uh, u is equal to u dagger because of the way I constructed this u as a reflection, r of a. This is what I mean by it's convenient to choose this reflection. Uh, and thus, this expression becomes a naught e to the i b naught z. And this in the middle is a product of D rotations, which are of the form R of A, E to the I, B sub K, Z, ending with an R of A on B naught. And this is exactly the quantum signal processing construction. Question for you. For this to be amplitude amplification, what should I choose the polynomial to be? I'll write the question here and let you think about it and give me the answer in a moment. What should poly of A be for this to realize amplitude? Amplification. What do you think? Yeah, you'd like it to be positive one, but it can't be exactly positive one because then that wouldn't satisfy the constraint. So you want it to be as close to positive one as you can make it. So it might go up and wiggle and wobble like this. And, uh, and 
And that's what it means to say that we're going to make a polynomial approximation that fits within the constraint that lets you um, get the transform that you desire. And what this transformation does is it takes in an arbitrary A and then maps that to the number one. So in other words, if we have an input that's A equal to this guy, remember A goes from minus one to one, so I just plot it zero to one here. This would be the input, and then this would be the output. But uh, if A is really, really small, like over here, then it wouldn't work so well. And then you'd have to use a longer, higher degree polynomial to make it sharper and sharper so that it then uh, does amplitude to amplification properly. Good. Questions? Yes, please. Is there an efficient um, algorithm to get the two oracles? In, in other words, I use these oracles A sub t and uh, B sub t. Uh, right here. These are the two oracles you mean, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Uh, I'm actually going to give those to you in, uh, in uh, right after the next step. Glad you're thinking ahead. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, how does the double drop there affect that equation? Uh, uh, how is that information that sort of gets explained in the equation of the RLS? How is the double block stereo intuition represented in this equation here, right? Yeah. With the RA? It's hidden. Because in this equation, I'm thinking about just a single block sphere. And I needed to reduce it to this equation because this is the quantum signal processing theorem. Uh, but eventually, you might just use this as the working theorem. That's exactly what we're going to do when we get to the quantum singular value transform. Uh, in the quantum singular value transform theorem, you explicitly keep two frames of reference, one which is the left singular vector frame and the other being the right singular vector frame. And I've given you the idea here with amplitude amplification, but I haven't called it that yet. And we'll see that um, if we uh, don't run out of time. Other questions? OK, let me try to uh, answer what you just heard by uh, showing you um, uh, how this connects with something you already know, which is the quantum search algorithm. I hope um, all of you uh, know something about Grover's search algorithm. And one of the neat things is that you can utilize amplitude amplification for search. And here's the statement of the problem that we want to, to solve. Uh, you were given a operator, which let's call a sub pi, which is equal to e to the i pi a naught a naught for some a naught, which is a uh, computational basis state. And that's what you want to find. So you are given this oracle, which can flip the sign, flip the phase uh, of the target element and you are asked to create a state as close to, to A naught as possible. Okay, that's the Grover search problem in the language of the amplitude amplification setup that we have. And the uh, answer to this is the following algorithm. Notice, you know, I've given you one of the, uh, the rotation operators. I haven't told you what unitary to use. So the fun thing is that Grover's algorithm, uh, in Grover's algorithm, you get to choose that unitary. And that unitary will be, does anyone know?
cas Et moi, moi, des cas Not quite, because uh, that reflection will actually be the um, uh, other operator that we're going to use, the B sub T. Um, but in order to make that operator work, we're going to choose U just to be the Hadamard. So it'll be N Hadamard operators on this, let's assume it's an N qubit system. And we're going to choose the initial state, B naught, to be the all zero state of our N qubits. And then we note that A naught, U, B naught, uh, is going to be approximately what? Well, U, B naught is just a bunch of Hadamards acting on zero. And so the value of this is what? One over the square root of two n. Yes. And that's let's call this uh, capital N. That's the A. That's the matrix, uh, small matrix element A that we're going to amplify. And our goal is to uh, utilize amplitude amplification to amplify that to the value one. Okay. And to accomplish that, we're going to choose the phases for our quantum signal processing. And what's kind of neat about this is that uh, uh, in this formulation of quantum arguments, you're giving a, a setting, which is a problem that usually involves an embedding of your uh, uh, hidden information, here that's A naught, into some unitary. And your goal to solve a problem is uh, to usually, all you do is choose a vector of real numbers. And for Grover's algorithm, the vector of real numbers you choose is P sub K all being equal to the value pi. That's how I write my pi's, for all K. And uh, as a homework problem, go work out polynomial that you get when this vector of p's is all pi, like so, and see what, what polynomial you have. Uh, in our case, this uh, vector pi, is, you're going to get an e to the i pi z, which is just a, uh, a phase uh, and then it's easy to work out the fact that u uh, b sub t u dagger is equal to e to the i h uh, i pi, the pi is right here, this is the p, let me write that more clearly, e to the i pi, that's the p, uh, h to the n, zero, zero, H, and, and had Mars. Uh, and this operator, some of you may recognize as being the uh, Grover inversion of our mean operator, I minus two sine naught sine naught. Grover inversion of our And it's completely popped up by the fact that we've used amplitude amplification and this uh, uh, quantum signal processing set of cases. And then you can work out um, how many steps are required and uh, it's going to be uh, on an order of root n. So I'll write it down for completeness. How many <clears throat> steps required? is determined by the degree of the polynomial that you need. And that degree is going to be pi divided by uh, two inverse sine of A, and that will be approximately root capital N. Okay. 
So that's Grover Sir talking. Question, yes. Uh, Synod, uh, I didn't define, did I? Synod is this. It's an equal superposition over all the computational cases. have phase rotations here also. So B sub P uh, is uh, a rotation about the uh, B axis. And that's here, we've chosen all the phases P to equal pi. And therefore, they look like phase rates. And we only get to choose this one phase angle. The other phase angle uh, was chosen for us in the setting of the problem. So the A naught was a uh, phase rotation by pi. Good. Other questions? Okay. Um, so the next step I have is uh, quantum signal processing, uh, the connection between quantum signal processing and Hamiltonian simulation. And that is the topic of qubitization. Okay. Uh, how many folks would like me to continue? Raise your hands. I mean, continue with no break. How many folks would like to take a five minute break at this point? Raise your hand. Looks like 50 50. More people want a break. Okay, so let's take a five minute break. Uh, and come back promptly at um, 5.15. So let me move to the topic of qubitization. Uh, and now we're really getting into the meat of things. Uh, everything so far was uh, setting the stage and uh, defining the uh, tools that we're going to be using. In qubitization, the first thing to realize is uh, you know, everything we've done so far has really just been looking at SU2 with a single matrix element, which is a number, a C number, A. Suppose, though, that I have a similar situation, a, a big multi-unitary, multi-cubic unitary, but now it has somewhere inside it a vector space with an operator that I'll suggestively label H. And it's located inside this operator U at the column B naught and row A naught. And let's answer the following question. So uh, uh, this was asked by uh, one of you. What are A sub P and B sub P? They're, let's say they're not given to you. And now we want to actually explicitly construct them so that we don't have to take, for, take them for granted. And the answer is the following. First, let me make a definition <clears throat> of two projectors. Let the projector pi on A naught be what you might expect, projecting onto A naught. And the projector pi B naught similarly Similarly, be the projector onto this column space. That's labeling our location. Okay, then using that, I will claim the following. And this is a construction that will solve the question that I just asked. If I have a 
single qubit and stellar state over here, and then a multi-qubit state upon which I'm going to act with uh, things in the space of the big operator U. Suppose I have a projector on the A naught used as a control for a knock gate. So this is called a projector controlled knock gate. And it means I'll flip this top qubit uh, whenever this state psi is in the vector space labeled by A naught. And I've been a little vague about the size of A naught. Eventually, it's not going to be a single dimensional vector space. It's going to be large, and that's why I defined it as a projector. And let me complete the circuit construction here. On this single qubit, I'm now going to perform a Z rotation, e to the minus i, b, z. So, and now I'll reverse things by doing a projector here again and using that to control a knot operation on my single qubit. And my claim is that the output of this state, of this circuit, is going to be e to the minus i b a sub 2 p acting on psi. So by redefining P's and so forth, I can make this give the A sub P. And by changing this from a projector on A naught to a projector on B naught, I'm also going to be able to get this uh, B sub P operator. So let me prove this claim. It's a very straightforward uh, circuit to work out. And I'll do this by being systematic. Let's label the initial state uh, and call that uh, chi zero. So chi zero, chi zero is equal to uh, psi zero. And then after this projector controlled knot, we'll have chi one, chi one. And that will be, well, let's expand psi here and call that uh, C A naught. We have a bipartite um, bipartition space here. We have a, a piece of the space in A naught and then a piece of the space in A perp. So we can expand any psi into those two components. Uh, psi 1 is going to be the state after I do the projector control knot. Uh, can somebody help me? What am I going to get? C, A naught, and what? One. Yeah, thank you. Because whenever we're in this A naught space, we're going to perform a knock gate on our cell. And when we're not in that A naught space, we do nothing to the ancilla. So it leaves it as a zero. That's the effect of the projector control knot. Next, we perform our A shift up here. And this gives us chi 2. And that will be e to the minus i, oh, plus i p, because this is a 1 here, plus i p uh, c times a naught 1, plus e to the minus i p d times a per 0. Now I'll perform an, another one of these projector controlled knots. That gives us chi 3. And it shouldn't be surprising to you. We're just going to uh, see that this flips this ancilla uh, qubit to be 0 so that we can factor it out. And we're going to get e to the i b c a naught plus e to the minus i p d times a perp, and our initial ancilla qubit is just reset to the zero state. And this is the same as the state that I have claimed over here, so this completes the proof. Okay. So I've given you a way to uh, construct this AP. Yes, question? Yeah, so um, is there a notation algorithm for reconverting 
Is there an efficient way to uh, deconstruct this high controlled uh, projector control dot into gates? Uh, I asked Nathan. That's a compilation problem. We will continue here. Any other questions? I'm sorry. The answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> other questions? Okay. Uh, let me now uh, remind you what a, the QSD iteration is. And then from that, we're going to see what QRealization looks like. So in a single QS quantum signal processing iteration, we will have in the middle of the, the quantum signal processing, given this uh, projector control dot type of uh, operation, we'll have something that looks like this. There will be an ancilla qubit, projector, a, a Z, P sub one, for example, uh, another projector control knot on A naught. And remember that in the uh, amplitude amplification algorithm, uh, we switch. So we are going to have our big operator U here. And then we switch to a projector on the column space. And then we have our Z, Z2, and so forth. So some projectors here, like so. And this continues. If we look at just one piece of this, let me outline a, a tiny piece of this uh, right here. This part of the quantum circuit looks like, well, remember that U has H in the middle somewhere located uh, by A naught and B naught. Now, this projector control thing with the A naught and B naught effectively puts the matrix H into a block labeled by a single qubit, which is either 0 or a 1. It moves it up in the top left, if you will. And this thing is called the qubitized Hamiltonian. H is a Hamiltonian. Of course, H could be any operator that's embedded in the block given by U. And this procedure moves it up into a place where it looks like a single qubit operation space. And that's the way we originally uh, uh, looked at things. Uh, but what I'm sharing with you today doesn't really need to utilize an explicit qubitization. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to um, use this as a starting point for the next thing, which is perhaps the most exciting thing and the climax of the entire uh, presentation today, which is what you can do if you're given this kind of a form. And the beautiful thing you can do is this transformation known as an eigenvalue transformation. And we will see that this allows us to do quantum simulation. <clears throat> and our starting point is that we are given this block encoded cubitized Hamiltonian, like so. And uh, projectors, uh, the two projectors uh, will be both onto this single qubit state zero. And I'm going to, uh, uh, at points, keep track of a, a left eigenspace and a right eigenspace by putting a tilde above one of the, the two. Um, but in the following, we won't actually need to do that. And let me remind you that this H here in the qubitized Hamiltonian, this is some uh, 
large permission matrix. It's a Hamiltonian that has been block encoded into a large unit term. And the question that we are asking is, what is the result when we compute quantum signal processing using this block encoded U? That is, what is U <coughs> sub E vector? Okay. And the answer is really beautiful. Without loss of generality, we may um, rewrite U a little more explicitly. Here I put in dots to indicate I didn't want to pay attention to what those terms are. But I can fill those in because U has to be unitary. And it suffices to make this choice. You can make other choices, uh, but they will all end up being equivalent to this in some way. That is, um, I'm going to make this look like uh, something that is permission. I'm sorry, um, a rotation, uh, a, actually a reflection. But uh, for yourself, go and check that uh, u dagger u is equal to identity. And in order to analyze this, let us di work in the diagonal basis uh, of the uh, eigenspace of the Hamiltonian. So let H be written out as a sum over lambda, 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 like this. And uh, using just this, Uh, then we can make the following observation. We want to understand the effect of U on this uh, space that has an extra ancilla as well as a state in the space of the uh, uh, Hamiltonian. So uh, imagine that we act on an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, lambda. So zero is ancilla. Lambda is the state of the Hamiltonian system. Um, and you should be able to read off from this expression for you what I'm going to get when you act on zero lambda. Okay. I, it is going to be, for the sake of time, I'll just write it out. Zero lambda plus square root of 1 minus lambda. This comes from this off diagonal term here. Okay. Uh, 1 lambda. And then let's act on the state 1 lambda. And this gives us a minus lambda. 1 lambda plus the square root of 1 minus lambda squared. 0 lambda. So U looks like this, and th this is really, really neat. U turns out to be a, um, uh, a block diagonal, I'm sorry, a direct sum over operator like that is very familiar right now, square root of 1 minus lambda squared minus lambda, and this is our reflection operator, answered with lambda lambda. That is, this unitary operator doesn't change the eigenstate, but it will rotate our, our, our qubit over here around the y-axis. And this is r of lambda. 
just like I had earlier, R of A. This is technically a reflection and a rotation around the y-axis. But the most important part here is, is that we have this direct sum. And so uh, this is as if we have n separate block spheres. All independently evolving, all independently being transformed. And each individual block sphere corresponds to a different eigenstate of a Hamiltonian. And that means we're going to transform the eigenvalues of each of those eigenstates when we do our quantum signal processing. Remember, the, the question was, what happens when we do quantum signal processing with this block-encoded Hamiltonian? And the result is given by this theorem. The theorem is called eigenvalue transformation. And it says that for u being, again, this block encoded h that has been cubitized so that it's 0, 1, 0, 1, like so. And remember, we're writing things in the eigenbasis of H, lambda, lambda. Uh, and for a construction of this form, then the quantum signal processing operation, U sub vec B, which is the sequence of uh, D, rotations, that is, uh, I, uh, D sub 2K minus 1, U dagger, uh, pi sub D, uh, two, uh, phi sub 2K, uh, U, uh, this is going to be a polynomial in H. This is a polynomial in a matrix where uh, poly H is defined as being the action of the polynomial on the eigenvalues of H, as you normally do when you have polynomials of matrices. So you can transform the entire Hamiltonian by a polynomial, and you get to decide on that polynomial. Okay. Um, this is the statement of the theorem for eigenvalue transformation. And uh, I'll sketch the proof for you really quickly and then take questions. The, the proof sketch is uh, not surprising because it's just going to be a utilization of the quantum signal processing theorem all over again. In fact, nearly identical to the amplitude amplification uh, proof. But now we have n separate block spheres instead. So what do we have? U is equal to uh, this is just the original u. So this u, as we derived up there, has uh, a direct sum over rotations on the single qubit for each of the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian, like so. Uh, and therefore, u sub d vector uh, is also written as a direct sum over each of these uh, eigenspaces. So we're going to have a product of, now uh, let us rewrite the, this um, projector control uh, phase shift as a Z phase shift inside each one of these block spheres. So we get an E to the I, E sub 2K minus 1 Z, 
we get this R of lambda. You have an e to the i e sub 2k. That's this term here. This term goes here. And then it says an R of lambda. And then we get the lambda lambda, meaning that each one of these block spheres evolves by itself. Okay, and so now we can collapse this because uh, we have the same kind of expression as we normally have for quantum signal processing uh, and rewrite this. Uh, let's first factor out uh, one overall factor of e to the i e naught z. Then we have a product over uh, a going from 1 to e of r of lambda e to the i e sub k z and lambda lambda. And this is uh, I, I, exactly the quantum signal processing construction. So that we can write the result as being you know, a direct sum over lambda of a, a polynomial in lambda dot, dot, dot. This would be our q and q star and uh, p star, q squared of 1 minus lambda squared, uh, lambda, lambda. And then by definition, this is just the matrix polynomial. That's common. And that's the proof. Okay. I hope you like that. Questions? Okay. Um, what polynomial would you like to have so that you can realize quantum um, simulation? Yeah, you'd like to have e to the ihg. That's a kind of a funny polynomial. What's a what's a more reasonable and easy to think polynomial that you can think of? Into what? Somebody tell us what the polynomial series might be for. Um, so, what polynomial? Well, uh, ideally, we would like e to the i h t. Um, but actually, uh, it might be easier to think first that this is cosine of h t uh, plus i sine. Because cosine and sine are reasonable polynomials that we all know how to deal with. And, uh, and indeed, that's how the constructions originally were made. And then we used uh, a linear combination of unitaries to combine the cosine and the sine polynomial. Okay. But um, uh, it does turn out you can use this complex polynomial directly. with a few uh, special uh, pieces of care. So I'll give you a reference for that. See the article by uh, John Martin. Uh, and he did this for a chemistry simulation. Uh, and the chemistry simulation uh, let's see, January, and 2023 uh, was a, a real-time dynamic simulation. Of a simple molecule. Um, but more prosaically, if you uh, don't uh, utilize the tricks needed to get the complex polynomial, uh, you can uh, choose whatever polynomial you want, 
and then go up to GitHub. And search for PyQSP, which is a Python package that takes in a polynomial that you specify. And it will give you as output the vector P. So it runs the romantic sheen algorithm for you. It's a program that's built on top of the best state of art of many different groups uh, and uh, acknowledged in the source code uh, because there are, are fast ways to do it that are unstable and there are slower ways to do it uh, more robustly. And some really lovely work by Lyndon's group at Berkeley which made uh, a lot of this possible. Okay, so that's quantum simulation. Yes, please. Yes, if you stick in a, a series of zeros, then you get a Chevy Chevy polynomial of the eigenvalues of your Hamiltonian in this construction. Yes. Ah, very good. Uh, if you would like to get a projection, look, you can be creative. Now, suppose instead of wanting to do a simulation, Suppose I made this polynomial. Uh, let's choose a polynomial, polynomial that looks kind of like this. V. Okay. And this is A, so it goes between 0 and 1. And let, you'd have to fix up the minus 1 to 0 as well. What would this do? Remember, this A, this A is actually lambda. It's the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. And the, the Hamiltonian eigenvalues go between minus one and one because they've been squashed in and renormalized so they would fit inside a block unitary. Okay? So what happens when you have a polynomial that does this to your eigenvalues? Yeah, speak up. I think I heard a mumble. No? Uh, you should react down to the energy yeah. plus states plus the normal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you could choose this to be some energy threshold that you want. Maybe it's not halfway. And you'll 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 smash, you'll disappear, you'll you get rid of all of the states which have an eigenvalue in this range, like above the threshold, and you'll uh, keep all the ones which have an eigenvalue below. Or amplify them to become one. So that's kind of neat. Um, let's try another one. Um, what if you choose your polynomial to be this? It can't go off forever. It's actually good. It will have to uh, cut off and wiggle around and be really mad at you. But until then, imagine that this polynomial looks like e to the lambda. What does that do? Or, or if we want it to be a little nicer to the polynomial, let, let's make it go e to the minus something lambda. Something plus zero. But think about it for a moment and tell me then what's the effect of having a polynomial which decreases exponentially? Very good. You get e to the minus, and, and if this is beta times lambda, it's like e to the minus beta h. It's the Gibbs ensemble. Isn't that neat? So you can choose your polynomial to be lots of things. You can even choose your polynomial to be 
something rather difficult to make into a polynomial, but still, why not? We can make a polynomial look like this with some work. A very high order polynomial. And now suddenly you're filtering out a band of eigenvalues, and you can sweep that across things. And so these are some of the, the really fun polynomials that the community has created. Lyndon has a beautiful article on these eigenvalue filtering polynomials. And he has a whole series of explicit uh, phases that you can get from that. Question? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering about the standardization transfer coefficients. Um, are these limited to small time and small normal types so that they could stand out for the exams and all? Or generally, it's the fact that these are not the only thing that limits how far you can go is the degree of the polynomial. Mm -hmm. Because the, the cosine uh, may not be a very good approximation if you have a low order polynomial expansion of it. So as long as you choose the degree to be sufficiently large, then you can exponentiate to accordingly large time. And, and so all of the detail about how well this algorithm works and, and the table that you saw earlier today from Nathan came from working all of that out in explicit detail. I see. Thank you. And that table is also compared from the shorter error versus one table in the polynomial. Correct. The large table. And it turns out that this algorithm saturates the best possible uh, simulation bounds now. So it is the optimal quantum simulation algorithm in the absence of any other knowledge about the Hamiltonian. But you can do better. Like if you know something about the Hamiltonian, you can choose your polynomials to do better because of your high knowledge like of the eigenvalue distribution. Other questions? So, you know, we've seen here that you can do more than just uh, quantum simulation. And uh, I'd like to build on that in the last 10 minutes or so and see if I can share with you what else you can do with this. Uh, question as well. Yes. Uh, so uh, please go on from the that the previous slide to that slide. Okay. Uh, how do you think that the projection I that you think of? Yeah. The pi pi square and I where where is this projection to? Okay. So you, you mean this right here? This is uh, a phase rotation around, uh, uh, it's defined exactly as, I define A sub T and B sub T up here. So see how I define A sub T and I use projectors to accomplish that. So the notation means do a rotation uh, uh, around the axis of the space defined by the projector. So in this case, it's projected to the ancillary cubit. Correct. Okay. It's just a Z rotation around the ancillary cubit, effectively, in the SU2 space. Thanks for the question. Other questions? OK. Yes, please. Yes, details, details, details. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We leave those for the practical people. Um, no, it, it actually is a, a real, a good question, something to think about. Uh, and uh, boy, Microsoft is strange. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe if I draw something here, it'll be happy. Oh, no. Uh -oh. Um, um, But uh, no, uh, as you heard from Nathan, quantum signal processing uh, does not, uh, uh, in this high level abstract um, description compile, it does not compile DOM very efficiently. This is, it is, as he said, a really nice problem to work on, how you would compile this DOM and build in uh, uh, knowledge that you have about the structure, about the target system that you're running it on, and make it work out more efficiently. I don't have answers for that. Other questions? Okay, 
Uh, let me see if this will let me actually uh, find our last topic here. Okay, so what I would like to do is to generalize and see if I can tell you about a protocol called quantum singular value transform. This was a result from a really remarkable article, very interesting. I'm not going to be able to scroll up and down anymore. Okay, so. I'm open to suggestions. I'm just going to use this and write everything on one page. Okay, so here we go. We are all slaves to our computers. Um, there's this really remarkable result from uh, 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 this uh, uh, quartet of authors, Andras Dillian, Yan Su, uh, Guang Hao Lo, and Nathan Lee. Uh, and this result is described in a 2019 paper in stock, supposing one of the theory of computation. And it was a, a real breakthrough paper. I, I consider this paper the most important result since Peter Schwartz author. And it is in this paper that they realized that the formulations that we had had of quantum signal processing uh, had been missing, missing a piece. In what I described to you and I constructed with amplitude amplification, it is not missing the piece. I used their result. But let me now give their version of the theorem, which is the uh, quantum singular value transform theorem. For a unitary operator that has a block encoding of a, a operator matrix A in it somewhere, I'll label this uh, as being in the column defined by pi and the row defined by pi tilde, like so. Uh, where uh, this matrix A can be any matrix at all. So it doesn't have to be square. It can be a, a large column vector. It can be square. It can be unitary. Uh, but no matter what it is, it will always have a singular value decomposition. And the matrix can be written out in terms of its uh, left singular vectors and its right singular vectors. And let me label these so that you know what the components are. These are the singular values, which are uh, positive real numbers non-negative real numbers, they can be zero. Uh, these are the singular vectors, left, right, singular vectors. And as homework, go and figure out uh, the singular value decomposition. And how it is different from eigenvalues and eigenvalue decompositions. It's a very important distinction. In physics, we do not use uh, SVDs as much as we should. In fact, the, perhaps the only place in physics that has widely used it up to now has been in the Schmidt decomposition. Um, but in fact, the singular value decomposition is the um, technical piece that makes tensor networks possible as well. And things like uh, renormalization group, if you will. But I'm not going to go into that here. So suppose we have a matrix embedded inside a unitary, and it has a singular value decomposition as I've given here. And therefore, we can write this matrix A as, uh, in terms of these projectors, pi u pi, like so. Then the theorem states that if we perform a series of operations, which is what I showed you as quantum signal processing, so 
that is, we'll do this iteration between left and right, projector controlled knots and uh, uh, rotations, Z rotations about the projected space. So that's D sub uh, pi sub D 2K minus 1, U dagger, pi tilde D sub 2K, U, and repeat that D over 2 times, so that we call the matrix U the photo of D times. Then the result is a polynomial transform of A this matrix, where this polynomial transform is defined in terms of the singular values. And that is, this is a sum over k of the polynomial applied to sigma sub k, and then w sub k, d sub k. And the proof of this is done exactly like we have done before uh, by using the QSP theorem uh, with reflections. Oh my, okay. But let's dwell on the importance of this theorem for just a moment. What I've shown you, what they created, is a method to perform a transform of the singular values of a matrix without knowing its singular value decomposition. To perform a singular value decomposition is, a, is usually something known as being exponentially hard in classical computation. Netflix does it to make uh, recommender matrices. It is the hard be behind principal component analysis, behind all sorts of important statistical techniques. Here, you can access those singular values without having to know how to do the singular value decomposition. It's, it's remarkable, it's almost miraculous. And it turns out that this algorithm uh, can be shown to give, uh, as I mentioned at the start, every known quantum algorithm uh, today, more or less. And you can read about this in Martin et al. Uh, a paper called the uh, Grand Unification. Of quantum algorithms. Presented as a tutorial in uh, PRX quantum. A pedagogical tutorial. In 2021. That's 040203. Okay. Great. Question. Yes, please. Yeah, so we have that polynomial of the singular values. Do you make that polynomial like a double function and refine it to the singular values? Yeah, yeah, but it has to satisfy those boundary conditions I gave you earlier. So, in uh, actually, what you would probably do is make a polynomial that looks kind of like this top half that I've drawn over here. And make that narrow. And as you can imagine, the narrower it is, the higher degree of polynomial you'll have to use. And then the more calls to this unitary. So there's a trade-off there. And what's beautiful is now you can think the art of algorithm design in quantum can now be reduced to algebraic properties of polynomials. And that includes Shor's algorithm. Other question. Shor's algorithm, by the way, is done by using a repeated uh, uh, thresholding of this. This, this step function uh, filters out the eigenvalues of the uh, uh, modular uh, multiplication unitary to being in the left half or the right half of the plane. And then you just keep on doing that in a binary search until you get the, the structure of Shor's algorithm. You find the eigenvalues, and that's phase estimation. 
questions. Yes, please. Maybe, maybe as a counterpoint, uh, of course, the key part of story about is positive externalization. The second somebody still has to tell you what to do, it doesn't just do side things, right? That's correct. And Ken's absolutely right that there, there are things I'm shoving under the rug. The, the modular exponentiation um, uh, and the comp computation of the powers of the unitary that you're estimating the eigenvalues or filtering the eigenvalues of has to be done. You can think, though, that that's classical in many ways. So maybe the essence of the algorithm. The thing that's disturbing about all of this, and, and Ken and I were talking about this earlier, look at Everything I've shown you in this lecture today is about a single qubit, SU2 dynamics. Have we just reduced quantum factoring and phase estimation to just single qubit dynamics? Is there nothing more to the most important quantum algorithms than just qubit, a single qubit? It's a qubit hidden in a big space, but it's, by God, just a single qubit set of dynamics here, where the, the essential dynamic is just one thing, which is you, you, you rotate by something that's unknown, like has an eigenvalue, which you don't know the value of, and then a rotation that you know. And you just keep on changing the thing you know, and you only do it around two axes of the block sphere, x and z. There are now generalizations of quantum signal processing and QSBT, which use three axes. And it gets slightly different performance, but it's still the same basic properties. But they're all like SU2. That's a little, I, I wish there were more to quantum algorithms than just SU2 dynamics. Thoughts, questions? Yes, please, to the back. Modular exponentiation. So if you formulate that part as the transition point going in, is it like absolutely equivalent to or just like adding to like the new like quantum You can read in this paper about grand unification, it actually gives you exactly Shor's algorithm, exactly the standard quantum phase estimation. But it also leaves open the door for something better. Um, to be explicit, you know Shor's algorithm has this Fourier transform in it. That Fourier transform is nothing more than a binary search and passing on pieces of one step of the search into the next step of the search. It's very classical according to this analysis. And according to this analysis, you can do better things than Fourier transforms. And that's also enough. Oh, by the way, I didn't write one, uh, one uh, polynomial for you here. Uh, and, and this is a polynomial that many of us uh, look at and, and make estimates about. So if this is lambda, um, it might be nice to have a polynomial that looks like, oh darn it, that looks like this. What's this polynomial? Modulo my uh, drawing ability. <coughs> C of alpha? Am I not drawing it right? Yeah, I mean to draw here one over lambda. Okay. And what, what do you get if you have a polynomial of one over lambda? You get the inverse. So that means that the that P of the polynomial of A is what? Say again? A inverse. A inverse, yeah. And what quantum algorithm gives you A inverse? Arrow has a demoid. There, I'm just giving you HHL. The polynomial. Isn't that lovely? 
and you can construct all sorts of algorithms this way. What if you make it uh, lambda squared? Then that's HHL squared or something like that. But, but look, there, there, there are lots of possibilities and many folks are now using this to construct other scenarios for quantum algorithms. It's been used by um, uh, Ashley Montanero and um, got the co-author to show an exponential gap in communication complexity. Because you can also use quantum signal processing in a distributed scenario, like Grover's scheduling algorithm. So there are lots and lots and lots of ways you can use this. And now you can just imagine new polynomials to make new quantum algorithms. Questions? Anybody else? Yes, please. Yeah, so I know some examples where this is able to get away with not actually performing the trade. So my question is, if you're asked to quantum get some flexible, for example, measuring the concentration of the transaction, will it somehow reduce uh, the complexity of the thing? Because, for example, in, in one example I know is that if you want to know a microcanonical concentration like this, you can do the protection on I'll give a negative example because I, I, one thing I've tried but not succeeded to do is to get a good quantum argument for heat capacity. And there you need to get not just the expected value of H, but the variance of H. So you need to get something uh, kind of like what Peter was showing in his beautiful lecture. Um, the purity, you know, the trace of rho squared. You need to get something like the uh, uh, variance of H. And so that's expected value of H minus expected value of H, I mean, H squared minus expected value of H quantity squared. And, uh, I don't know how to do that with quantum signal processing. So there are thermodynamic quantities that you cannot naturally immediately get out of this uh, framework without doing something more. So it certainly doesn't encompass everything that you might want to do, but it does seem to encompass all the major quantum algorithms and their constructions. Great. Okay, well, I hope I've given you good food for thought and for discussion tonight. And uh, thank you all.